good afternoon. Um, so, as I said, my name is Brenna. I am a front end engineer for TED Talks, where we write a lot of our internal apps and tools um, in Ember. We are looking for Ember devs, so come talk to me if you're interested in that. Um, I have a feeling that some of the code might be hard to read, so there's a link to my slides available. It's talks.brennaobrien.com slash ember dash select if you wanted to follow along. Okay, so uh, hands up, who's built an Ember app before? A lot of hands, awesome. Um, who has used the select element in an Ember app before? Okay, now keep your hand up if you have been frustrated by the select element in Ember before. Right, a lot of hands, and I'm keeping mine way up high. Um, because when I started out with Ember about a year ago, this was the bane of my Ember existence. It haunted me from project to project and consistently um, gave me a lot of troubles. So about a year ago, this is how you did a select element in Ember. Um, it is a built-in view that um, did a little something like this, and it did magic and made a select for you. Um, so. Magic can be really good a lot of the times where it reduces the overhead that you as a developer um, need to go to to do common tasks. But I think we need to also be aware of magic sometimes. <laughs> Basically, it's great when it does what you want and, and then when it doesn't do what you want, it's extremely frustrating. So one of the first things that I found really difficult to deal with with um, the Ember select was the fact that it was two-way bound by default. So what do I mean by two-way binding? Um, this is a simple example where, um, say, in your select element, the um, value in the select is reflected in the UI elsewhere. Those values are coupled, they're two-way bound, um, change to one ends up being a change to the other. In a lot of situations where you have um, kind of isolated information, this is totally appropriate and a good way to go, and it simplifies things a lot. But I ran into some use cases, this is actually something that I was asked to build, where um, the select element state didn't match with what it reflected in the UI. Here's an example of a filter that when a choice is made in the select, it would just update a running list um, elsewhere. So two-way binding wasn't appropriate there, and I had to jump through a lot of hoops basically wrapping my um, Ember select in its own component to sort of um, simulate a one-way binding and um, not have my data leaking out. The other thing that I found really difficult was I had no idea um, what HTML, what DOM this thing was actually rendering. I had a simple request to make some elements in a select disabled. And um, the solution I found, uh, here's a quote from Stack Overflow. This is a simple approach for rendering a disabled option with Ember Select. Um, basically, you have to reopen the built-in view um, and add the support for disabled. As a new developer, that's a scary thing to do, to go kind of modify and extend core code. It's not super approachable, and if you're used to writing a select in HTML, you're used to just throwing an attribute on there, and so this is a bit of a barrier. So, like I said, um, this haunted me on several projects that I worked on. This is a real quote from our um, Ember.js chat at TED. Um, this went on and on and on. Uh, light at the end of the tunnel, a little later in the year, when I found out that Ember Select is going to be deprecated. Um, so, I was happy about that, and I took an interest in learning about what my alternatives were, basically. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about building a better select um, with modern Ember patterns. So we're going to use real HTML so that we have almost complete control over what we want it to do. We're going to use the data down actions up pattern. And along the way, we're going to learn about a lot of cool new Ember features that have landed um, since that select element was deprecated. All set? All right. So, let's take a look at first just building this out with plain old HTML. Um, if you've ever done this in HTML, it should look pretty familiar. We're just gonna use um, a little convenience with some HTML bars um, and use an each loop to iterate over our options to make that a little less tedious. So, this kind of assumes that you've got um, 
like an array of objects that you're gonna use for your options list that can come from um, a static list or a model in your app, and we're just gonna access something like, uh, you're doing a dropdown of languages, we'll use the language code for the value, and we'll use the language name for um, the label on our option. Um, so now let's talk about this data down, actions up part. This is um, a, a kind of mantra in Ember lately. You might also see DDAU. If you wanna confuse your non-Ember colleagues, throw that acronym in somewhere. <laughs> um, so what that basically means is we want our data flow to be um, sending data down like into components, into um, stuff that we're rendering, and then we wanna respond to actions that are like bubbling up. So this is actually really great because it's similar to what you might be used to dealing with if you're just using plain old JavaScript or jQuery with a select. Um, how do we usually deal with form elements changing? We respond to an onChange action and that action bubbles up your DOM. So that's exactly what we're gonna do with our um, real HTML rendered Ember better select. So what does that look like? Um, all we need to do really is add to our existing code this um, onChange uh, attribute and we can tell that to fire an action and I'm gonna call that action language did change and Along with that action, I can go ahead and send the value of whichever option dispatch the change event. So this will be in wherever um, template you're rendering the select, and then in the controller or in a component, as we'll see later, you're gonna catch that action, um, grab the value as a param, and then you can go ahead and do whatever you want with it. So in this case, I'm just going to um, set a property called selected language code um, to whatever value, and you end up with something like this. So I pick my language, the code sends an action up, and then I'm handling it in this particular template by just displaying the value. So that's the actions up part of this. Let's also make sure we send act uh, data down. So the most common use case for this is usually when you want to um, send in something like an initial value when you get to the page if that select's already holding um, uh, an existing value. You also might wanna send data down if for some reason this updates in another part of your app state. You can also do the same thing. So um, in regular HTML, we indicate that a select element um, option is selected with the selected attribute. And this is one of those sneaky HTML attributes where uh, no matter what you put in um, quotes, you can say selected equals false, um, and it'll still be selected. It's just the presence of it needs to be there. Um, but HTML bars is sophisticated enough now that we can do something like this, where I'm gonna set the selected attribute equal to some curlies, and you can write a really simple is equal helper here that just compares the two things that you give it, and we'll ask this is equal helper if um, the current language in the iteration of our loop is equal to the selected language that we're passing in. Um, and that's gonna return a Boolean, and it's smart enough to know to um, either render out that selected attribute or not, depending on what your curly evaluates to. Uh, now this is really powerful. Um, some of you might have remembered that not too long ago, anytime we wanted to do a dynamic attribute, we needed to use the bind attribute syntax. Um, this works out okay most of the time. Um, something like the value is pretty easy to simulate with bind attribute, but what if we were trying to replicate that selected? Um, how would you do that? <laughs> that turns out to be not as straightforward. Um, so having the power to evaluate stuff in line here is really awesome. So that, my friends, is dynamic attributes. So uh, bind attribute was actually deprecated way back in uh, Ember 1.10. Hopefully, um, I don't think too many of you are back there, but, um, sorry, this is a little backwards on my sides. Um, I think bind attribute, something's weird with the version because uh, the new feature can't come before the deprecated one, I don't think. Or maybe it did, yes, because we're good about being 
nice um, and weaving things in. So yeah, dynamic attributes are available as of 110, and bind attribute was deprecated in 113. Encourage you to use those because it gives you a lot of power um, to do some simple logic within your templates and cleans up the kind of readability of your templates quite a bit. So put that all together and we get something like this where I'm able to have an initial selection here, but I can um, pass that initial selection in as data down and I can make changes with actions up and you'll notice that that original value does not get mutated by my select anymore. So that is really awesome and allows you all sorts of flexibility to manage your data flow as you see fit. So remember my second problem dealing with select was that pesky disabled option. This turns out again to be pretty straightforward with our new tools. Um, so let's return to the idea of having a model that we're using to um, generate our select options. A really easy way to do this is to set a computed property on your model that evaluates to a Boolean to use as a flag for something being disabled or not. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to the example of fruits. And let's say we wanted, for some reason, to disable all the fruits in our list that are yellow. We can go ahead and use a computed property that sets that flag. And then we'll use our dynamic attributes again to say um, disabled is equal to that fruit dot is yellow property. And again, this is clever enough to know whether or not to uh, display that attribute based on the Boolean value of what your curlies evaluate to. That looks a little something like that. No yellow fruits, we don't want those. So this is great. Um, we've built something that is uh, way more flexible. We have complete control over the DOM. Um, the only drawback to this is we've lost the reusability of our magic. Um, Sometimes it's actually nice to have a bit of reusable code that you don't have to go through the um, slog of like writing out a lot of template for. Um, so can we have a kind of happy medium between having code that's very flexible for us to use and having code that's reusable? We absolutely can, that's where components come in. <laughs> this is one of my favorite images ever on the internet, by the way. I put it as my lock screen background and it made me happy every time I looked at my phone. <laughs> um, so, yes, we can have it both ways. Um, a great solution here if you find yourself reusing the select code within your apps. Um, say there's multiple places around um, your app that you need to have a selector to um, choose a fruit. Um, that's something where a component is really powerful to um, abstract that code a bit away into um, your own reusable bit of code. So we don't, actually don't have to do too much to um, change what we've got into its own component. We're going to move it into its own component file. Um, and the only thing we need to do now is make sure that that action actually bubbles up out of our component. So the kind of like way that probably most of you are used to doing this um, is by within the component, so the blue code, we're going to catch that fruit to change action again, and we're gonna use this dot send action um, to send that up out of our component. And then wherever we're rendering the component, um, we need to pass in the name of the action that we want to um, be bubbled. So um, usually you just go with the same thing, is that straightforward? And then out in that outer scope, you're gonna then handle um, the bubbled up action. Um, so this is a good pattern, but it's actually one of the things that I found really confusing um, when I got started. Having a, an action name in just as a string um, was kinda hard for me to keep track of because it just looked like another property a lot of the time. Um, and this also starts to bite you when you start nesting components several levels deep because you have to bubble actions up and up and up and up and up. And it's, it's yeah, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, components are a great tool for us, but passing actions wasn't really um, a, an easy process. 
luckily, we have closure actions now. So this landed in 1.13, available in any version after that. Um, and the way that closure actions work is this allows you to, um, instead of having to bubble up in an internal action handler, um, you're actually just going to be able to, wherever you're rendering the component, um, so you can, instead of, um, instead of giving it a named action, uh, sorry, the name is a little mismatched there, you can actually tell it that I want you to use an action called update fruit. So I love this because not only is it way more explicit in your template what's happening here, you know that this is going to um, do an action, run a function, um, you also do not have to bubble this on your own. It's just gonna look for anything um, in that outer scope called update fruit and it's gonna be able to take um, the values that you've sent out from your deeply nested component. So you can go ahead and start layering things in um, as like many layers in between as you need and that's gonna bubble up without having to repeatedly send action. You just need to um, pass up the name in your templates. So this is really fantastic and again, I think it's a lot more readable. So that's the actions up when we've turned this into a component. How about doing data down once we've turned this into a component? So it's gonna look actually pretty similar. Um, we're still gonna iterate over um, our fruit and this time we'll just need to, wherever the template, uh, the component is called, we're gonna pass in that array of fruits and we're gonna pass in the selected fruit um, as an initial value. And we haven't really had to change much of our template, we're just making sure we send in good data. But what about something like this? What if we wanted to make that disabled key something dynamic? Um, it's conceivable that in um, multiple places where you're using this fruit select that you might wanna have a different type of fruit be disabled. So, um, you know, what if I wanted to pass in disabled uh, key is red? I've got this is yellow hard coded in here. So previously, whenever I needed to do a dynamic key lookup like that, my solution was usually to render a nested component. So instead of just doing that option straight within the each loop, um, I would set up something like a, a fruit select option component and this is going to allow you to um, make an attribute binding within that uh, option component. And you can do something like set the value of the disabled um, attribute with a computed property in that one and you'll compare, you'll be able to uh, dynamically look up that disabled key with this line up here where we're um, using ember.get with uh, this.get fruit and this dot get disabled key. So this works, but it's kind of a lot of overhead just to get a dynamic key, and you gotta pass a lot of extra stuff in so that that inner component knows about it. We gotta send everything in there, and your template is a little less readable um, than what we're used to seeing with just a simple option. So there's actually a really fantastic solution to that, and that is our friend the get helper. Um, so this landed in Ember 2.1 and the way that this works is it's just gonna allow you to kind of bypass all that extra work to um, get a dynamic uh, key lookup and you can do it right in your template here. So for the disabled attribute, I use the get helper, I give it an object and then a key and it's gonna go ahead and do the an ember.get under the hood and uh, just throw that in there nicely without a lot of extra overhead on my part, and now I'm free to pass in a dynamic um, key to my component. So, we've built an awesome data down, actions up, select component um, that's tailored to our app, but still really flexible. What if you wanna do two-way binding back? Um, I know that um, two-way binding has kind of got a really bad rap. Um, I think maybe we all got burned by it early on when um, framework community was super gung-ho about that. 
Um, but in some cases, like I say, it is appropriate if um, you're just dealing with uh, a local app state and you actually have a state that's tightly coupled. Sometimes two-way binding is just uh, the easier, better choice for that. So um, there's actually a really great way to, again, have the best of both worlds, and that is the mute helper. So this comes along with closure actions. So it's going to be available anywhere that closure actions are. So that's going to be um, 113 and up. And the way that that works is instead of passing in um, a named action, you're gonna be able to just say, hey, I want you to mutate this value instead. So if you look at the top here, you'll see I'm using that on change closure action syntax again. But this time, instead of putting um, an action name, a function name in there, I'm gonna actually just tell it to mute, mutate a value called selected fruit. Now, we just need to do a little extra work here to get this to kind of play nice with what we want. Um, right now, our existing code sends in a fruit object for the data down part, but our actions up is just sending up a value. So this isn't gonna work really awesome as a two-way binding because our, we have a bit of a mismatch between the data that we're using. So what we really want is to be able to send up a fruit action so that that can be properly mutated with um, a piece of data of the same format. But that's a pretty easy workaround here. What you're gonna be able to do is, this is sort of like the power and flexibility um, that you have with closure actions, is instead of just um, letting that bubble straight up, you can go ahead and catch your fruit to change action within the component and you can do what you need to do. So here, we're going to take the value and we're just gonna do a lookup um, by ID to find the corresponding object. And then we'll use the closer action um, kind of inside here. Instead of doing this dot send action because um, our action is passed in as an attribute, we can just go ahead and use a this dot get lookup for whatever got put into on change and that function is gonna run, and we're able to pass selection as a parameter up to that function. So lots of power, lots of flexibility when you're working with closure actions, and in fact, it's very used to, it feels more natural um, to how we know functions operate in JavaScript, so this is fantastic. Putting that together, um, this is a quick example of using um, the same component to either do a one-way or two-way binding, so. I call it choose your own binding adventure. Um, same code in the component, but as the um, consumer of the component, you can choose what your data flow um, needs to be just by passing in either a, a named function or the mute helper with the value that you want to mutate. Really awesome. So, what have we done? We've built our own select component that uses custom HTML. We've allowed completely custom data flow as we see fit in our app. And we've also learned about all these really awesome, powerful features um, like dynamic attributes, closer actions, um, mute, and the get helper. Put that all together and I say you have a um, select in your app that is flexible, reusable, and modern. And that is exactly what your Ember apps and the things in your Ember apps should be. Um, so you can kind of like choose your level of abstraction here. Um, pick whatever, um, whatever is getting repeated for you in your apps um, as a select code. Abstract that into a component as you see fit. Um, and like do whatever you d need to do that works for you. Um, as an example, all of our internal apps are built in Ember, so um, we've worked on a little reusable component that suits our needs at TED called TED Select. Um, so some of the features that we wanted were um, allowing the options to be sortable, allowing multi-select versus single select, and this handles that. It doesn't handle everything. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can make a select do, but I think choosing the right level of abstraction for your needs is um, a great path that we can follow moving forward in our apps. So how did I figure out how to do all this? Um, this is your friend. Um, 
On the Ember.js blog, the release posts every six weeks are really fantastic for keeping up to date um, with evolving um, things within the framework. Um, this is where I found out that uh, Ember Select was going to be deprecated. And I started reading up and getting excited about new ways to do this. And I keep up with this whenever a new post comes out and see all the cool new stuff that this framework is evolving to do. Um, I really think it's fantastic. I've seen in just a year's time, anything that's a pain point is actually getting solved. Um, even this morning, hearing about the render performance uh, gains in Glimmer 2, like that's been one of the other things that um, I've been having trouble with. And just to see that um, this level of um, action in the community and the core team to um, bring us what we need and continue to grow Ember is really fantastic. So I do encourage you all to keep up with this and hopefully you'll get excited about new Ember features and that can be incentive to upgrade your apps and keep things up to date. Um, so I leave you with that. I hope you can all take away um, stuff from here to build awesome select elements and hopefully other things within your app. Thank you.